Should the Ravens sign Julio Jones? We talk about that and more next year on Locked On Ravens. You are Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And we return here with another episode of Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostriker of Ravens Wire. Of course, we're here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Ravens your first listen of the day. We're free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube. And today's episode of Locked On Ravens is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online is who covered this season with more props, odds, and lies than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. And we're back here talking about another week. Of Ravens football, of course, is again, we're starting to creep closer and closer to the regular season. I do know it's a couple of months away. We're going to start hitting milestones real soon, talking about OTAs and training camp and the preseason. And finally, that regular season is getting closer and closer. But here today, we have a ton to talk about on the show. We're going to get into the Ravens. I guess you could call it a reported signing, although Kate Urban, Brent Urban's wife, tweeting out that he was signing with the team. And then you have Brent Urban posting a picture himself of himself and some Ravens gear, a little throwback picture. So I'd say those are two pretty good sources in terms of whether the Ravens are be, will be signing Brent Urban officially. I know it hasn't been announced by the team, but I'm going to say it's pretty set in stone, I'd say, based off those two sources. So we'll talk about Brent Urban. We'll also be diving into what the Ravens should sign Julio Jones. There's been a ton of talk about receivers and veterans coming to Baltimore potentially. So we're just going to focus on one today in Julio Jones. Then we'll also be talking about still the retirement of Sam Cook, a player who is such a a staple in Baltimore Ravens history. We'll continue to celebrate his career, talk about the importance of just what he meant to this team, and talk about the player who isn't necessarily replacing him, but is going to be taking his place on the team as the punter in Jordan Stout. So again, so much to talk about here on Locked on Ravens today. Great episode in store, but if you are here with us in video form on YouTube, you can see my face and my background and everything. Be sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel also. It helps me out a ton. I greatly appreciate it. If you want the other Ravens content five days a week, we put it out every Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. Eastern time. So if you want Ravens news, analysis, opinions, five days per week, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. Again, I really appreciate it. We've we already had subscribers. We've had a ton of them, actually. We're at about 1.6K right now. Our goal is 2,000. That's our next one. I greatly appreciate every one of you. And if you're thinking about subscribing to the channel, I, I highly recommend you do so. Just a little personal opinion of mine. But if you're listening to audio form, I greatly appreciate all the audio listeners as well, whether you're listening, driving, to work or from work or at work or wherever. Thank you for listening on your favorite podcast platforms. Be sure to follow and turn notifications on. And also be sure to follow me on Twitter at KOSTRIKER34 and the Locked on Ravens account at Locked on Ravens. So let's dive into the Brent Urban reported signing, not official signing, but kind of official signing. Because again, not, not officially announced by the team, but Brent Urban's wife, Kate Urban, posting that Brent Urban was signing with the Ravens. Again, Brent Urban posting that picture of himself in some Ravens gear. So I'm going to go with it. And a lot of people already have. So just kind of saying that official, not official, you know, we're going to say it's a little official, but it's okay. Brent Urban's a player that I think does fill a, a need for this team, but it comes with a couple of different circumstances. Now we know the defensive line has undergone a couple of changes, right? There's been the Clayus Campbell resigning. There's been the Michael Pierce addition. Brandon Williams, it seems less and less likely by the day he's coming back. I'd probably probably pencil him in as a guy who's not coming back. And, you know, he's been a ton to the team also. But so Michael Pierce coming in. You have Travis Jones as well. You also have young guys, you know, Justin Metabike, Roger Washington. But the Ravens, with this signing of Brent Urban, it kind of begs the question of where does he fit along the defensive line when you're also factoring in a player like Derek Wolf, who obviously missed the 2021 season after having a really, really good 2020, one of the best run stuffers in the league that year. But what's what's going on with Derek Wolf, right? We haven't seen him for a year. There was the picture he posted on social media of him recovering from a surgery. But does is this the beginning of the end for Derek Wolf? Are the Ravens going to make a move for for or is it like an urban for wolf swap that we're going to see because if we think about the ravens defensive line rotation right now it is very very deep and that's a very good thing right it's a good problem to have 
Clayus Campbell, Michael Pierce, Brent Urban, Travis Jones, Justin Metabike, Roger Washington. You know, you're, you're six deep there, right? You're six deep there. That's not even counting Derek Wolf. So if you add Derek Wolf into that equation, you're seven deep. You have a bunch of really solid veterans, some nice young talent there as well. So where does that put Derek Wolf right now? Because Clayus Campbell, he's not going anywhere, right? Michael Pierce, he's not going anywhere. Obviously, when Urban is signed, he's not going to likely go anywhere. You know, the contract is for, you know, kind of like the veteran minimum. So you're not you, you could cut him with probably minimal loss. But at the same time, you know, they brought him in for a reason. So this is going to be like a training camp battle between Wolf and Urban. Is that what's going to happen? A lot of questions to be answered in the coming days, especially when the announcement of the signing is seemingly offic officially announced by the team. Because obviously, Travis Jones isn't going anywhere. Right. Just a minute. BK, no. Project Washington. I mean. I'd be I'd be surprised if he went anywhere. So where does this leave Derek Wolf, a player that really, you know, we haven't seen in a very long time? But Urban the player, a very good one. Obviously, spent the first four years of his career in Baltimore. He was a fourth round pick very, very many years ago in the 2014 draft out of Virginia. During his time in Baltimore, he ended up accumulating 52 tackles, three and a half sacks. Then he went on to spend time with Chicago and Dallas and Tennessee in his career, in his Eight seasons, he's had 107 total tackles, six sacks. So a player that can generate some interior pressure, can also stop the run, quick first step, very powerful hands. Someone who I think can slot in and be just a solid rotational player. They don't need him to be a star. They have Calais Campbell. They have Michael Pierce. And if let's let's say Derek Wolf ends up getting released by the team, you have three solid veterans with Campbell, Pierce, and Urban. You have three solid young guys with Jones, Matabike, and Washington. Now, again, the rotation, you have to kind of figure that out and everything, but Urban is a tall guy. He's 6'7", and Calais Campbell is 6'8". You have those two guys listed at those heights. Those are some tall dudes, and just opponents lining up against them on the offensive line, they're going to be, like, hulking over, and quarterbacks will get swallowed up by them. So it's kind of funny to, to think about Calais Campbell and Brent Urban on the defensive line together, two just massive human beings. But again, we've talked about this with Mike Davis and Vince Beagle. These are not signings that are going to move a needle, per se, where it's not like, okay, the Ravens signed Brent Urban, they're winning the championship, or the Ravens signed Brent Urban, they're, they're missing the playoffs, right? It's not that type of needle-moving signing. You know, it's a position of depth already without Urban on there. Even if you take Wolf out without Urban, it's still a position of depth where they have reshaped it to have, I'd say, you know, a five-deep rotation, which is really good. You had Urban in there, you got six. So you're able to account for injury you if everybody's healthy you're probably making a good player and active maybe two depending on the situation depending on what team you're playing but I think it's a signing that the Ravens will benefit from that Urban will benefit from it seems like he really enjoyed his time in Baltimore you know his wife Kate Urban was talking about how he, he loved his time there they loved their time there in Baltimore and they're super excited to to get back so it's really nice that this is a reunion of sorts I know this has kind of been like the reunion tour for Baltimore a little bit this offseason obviously the unfortunately failed signing as Darius Smith. You have Michael Pierce coming back. And obviously now Brent Urban, it's kind of funny to see all these guys come back, but it's also kind of nice because they're guys who will be able to make an impact. And the Ravens defensive line was a unit that like most positions on their team last year was hit pretty hard by injury. You had Calais Campbell, who we talked about on this show, how before the year in 2021, I was talking about how he was a guy who I wanted to see you know, kind of get rested a little bit in the beginning of the year. You could have him for the end of the year in the playoffs really well rested. Well, he played the most snaps of any Ravens defensive lineman by far on that team in 2021. So you're able to manage snaps a little bit better this time around. I think that's a big thing for them. They got younger. They got more athletic. Interior pass rush is there, which is something they haven't had for a while. So I am all on board with this Brent Urban signing. It's something that, again, it's not the most spectacular, like, wow, look at this move. Like, it's, it's not flashy, right? It's not a flashy move that people are going to go out and say, this was the this was the best move ever. But if Urban can contribute, if he can outperform his contract, which for a veteran minimum salary, you know, I think that he can do that. You look at it, and I think it's a great deal overall. So I'm happy with this. It gives the Ravens depth at a position where if they suffer some injuries and they have to go with a four-man rotation or something, they're not signing guys off the street or bringing guys up from the practice squad in this situation, assuming they do keep six or even seven, right? Derek Wolf at the time of this recording hasn't been cut, hasn't been released. His future, I don't I don't know right now. You know, it's it's an interesting question. But if the Ravens keep seven defensive linemen, I find that pretty unlikely. But if they do, 
then they'll really, really have the ability to account for injuries. So Brent Urban, he's he's back in Baltimore. And when the team officially announces it, it it'll be great and everything will be official. And that'll be that. There is no more, you know, oh, well, the, you know, Brent Urban and his wife reported it is a really official, you know, I'd say, again, those are two pretty good sources. So as many people have, I'm rolling with it too. Brent Urban back in Baltimore, it's going to be great. But again, a solid signing overall. We'll head into our first break here, though, on Lockdown Ravens. Still a ton to talk about coming up as we'll dive into the topic of discussion of whether the Ravens should sign Julio Jones or not. So be sure to stay tuned. Still a ton to talk about on Locked on Ravens. But first, I do want to tell you a bit about Bet Online and the basketball playoffs. They've been pretty good this this playoff season. Not not a ton of amazing games. There have been some, don't get me wrong, but a lot of blowouts. And if you want to bet on those games still, obviously the Warriors and Mavericks series right now, it's big Golden State up 3-0 right now, but you also have the Heat and Celtics where you have the Heat up 2-1. Be sure to do it with Bet Online because our partners at BetOnline continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. You can still find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including the basketball playoffs, Major League Baseball scores, you have fights, and even the futures for the NFL season next year. BetOnline is a continued source for our sports waging information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. As the website today, use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online where the game starts. We're back here. Our second segment of Locked on Ravens. Kevin Allstriker, your host, still here with you again. Thank you so much for making Locked on Ravens your first listen of the day. Be sure to subscribe to this channel on YouTube and follow us wherever you get your podcasts in audio form, but also make your second listen Locked on Sports today. Let's now talk about a conversation that we've had a couple times on this show, but not necessarily too in depth on this one player, but a player that I think the Ravens should sign in Julio Jones. And yes, that's my answer. Should the Ravens sign Julio Jones? I think the answer is yes. Now, there are a lot of factors when looking at this. Obviously, when you look at the Ravens receiver room, a lot of youth. Not saying they, that the young guys can't do it, right? I like Rashad Bateman a lot. Devin Duvernay, James Prochet, Tyler Wallace, all guys I believe in. Are you looking at a room right now where even with the inexperience factored in, you have four reliable guys with those four. And even then, you know, we we haven't seen all these guys in a full-time role. We haven't seen Rashad Bateman as the, num- the number one wide receiver. We haven't seen Devin DuVernay as a number two option. I'm assuming James Prochet would be number three based off of experience and Tyler Wallace number four, right? These are guys who haven't had a ton of snaps at the NFL level. And again, not saying they can't do anything with it. I think they're all going to have really good seasons, but adding a veteran in, would give that room some stability. It would give them some experience and it would give them just a stabling presence uh, of a veteran who has been there, who knows how this league works. And look, these guys have been in the league for three years, two years. They have a little understanding, but Julio Jones, who has been there for quite a while, obviously spent most of his career with Atlanta, 10 years there, one year in Tennessee. I mean, this is an 11 year veteran we're talking about. He knows cornerback matchups. He knows how to get in certain spots, get open, work back. He, He has all these, veteran tricks that could really work out. And a lot of these veterans do, right? But why Julio Jones in particular? Well, we were talking about a lot of just how this isn't March anymore, how this is not the first week, first couple weeks of free agency where all these receivers are there. And it's not just like the star guys too, like DJ Chark, a guy who I really, really liked formerly at Jacksonville now in Detroit. He's a player that I thought would have been amazing, assuming that we we all knew that this was coming, which, you know, I, personally, I didn't know that Marquise Brown was going to be traded on draft night. That came as an absolute shock to me. So w- what quickly went from a position of comfortability, at least for a lot of people, uh, of strength for a lot of people, where you have, all right, Marquise Brown, Rashad Bateman, Devin DuVernay, right, even without a veteran, this is looking pretty good, right, to all of a sudden Marquise Brown, the number one guy on this team, is now in Arizona. How, how are you going to make up for that? Is it going to be you're just going to roll with the young guys? I wouldn't necessarily hate that option, but I think that the better option at this point would just to be to bring in a veteran. And Jones is a player that we all know what he was during his prime in Atlanta. I mean, an absolute stud, all pro, pro bowler, right? Just one of the most dominant receivers in this league over the course of his career in his 11 years. He's got 879 passes for 13,330 yards, 61 touchdowns, a catch rate of 64.3%. So he's a player that big body guy. And we talked about for a lot of the time, even dating back to last offseason, how the Ravens needed that big body type receiver, go up there, get contested catches. And we thought it was going to be with, Miles Boykin, right? A lot of people said, hey, you know what? Miles Boykin is going to be that guy for them. And with the speed and the size and everything, that's what the Ravens wanted him to be. And it just didn't work out that way. 
You have Jones, who has done it at this level before. Jones, who is a proven veteran and someone I think, again, I talked about that stability. He could provide that to a room of very young, talented receivers, teach them a couple things and, and kind of go from there. Now, there's been a lot about signing Julio Jones and the, the rumors from Julio Jones and the Ravens. You know, those two combined have been pr- pretty, pretty active over the past couple of seasons, I would say, with before he was even a free agent this time around. We had heard the trade rumors, I guess, or trade ideas surrounding Jones and the Ravens before he was traded to Tennessee ultimately for a second round pick. And a lot of the conversations then, at least from my end, were, look, he's a great player. We know what he brings, but what's the compensation the Ravens would have to give up? Is it a second round pick, which is what Tennessee ultimately had to give up? Would the Ravens be comfortable giving up a second round pick plus paying Julio Jones Whatever his salary was, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but, you know, a multi-million dollar salary, you know, tens of millions of dollars on that contract. And the answer was no. Tennessee ends up getting him, and it, it doesn't go well in Tennessee. Not a great year overall. Injury riddled for him, which is nothing new. Only played in 10 games and caught 31 passes, 434 yards, and one receiving touchdown. So not a great year. Stock really isn't that high right now and I think it shows that he's still on the market that yeah they, they, there's a little bit of image repairing not not that he's like done anything bad but he's been a very injured player over the course of his career and that's another thing where a lot of people are hesitant and saying well why would you sign Julio Jones when you know he's just gonna miss four six eight games well I think if you account for that early even before the season starts you have a better a better chance of being able to mitigate that but to get 12 healthy games out of Julio Jones, 14 healthy games out of Julio Jones. I think that is very worth it in this offense that I think a lot of people are starting to think that, yeah, this is going to be a run heavy team. Obviously two tight ends taken in the draft. You have no wide receivers, even after trading away Marquise Brown taken there, they seem confident in their guys. And you know what? I don't blame them, but I think adding a veteran here does not hurt, especially when you can get again, 12, 14 games out of a player, hopefully fully healthy. And also, Load management could be there if you really want it because you have these young guys who are, you know, chomping at the bit to play and do that. And I don't think Julio Jones, his addition, if he is signed by the Ravens, would necessarily mean that all of a sudden James Proche gets, you know, another red shirt year and doesn't play anymore. Tylen Wallace doesn't play his second season. I don't think that's it. I think for the Ravens, and it seems like the, the more likely route at this point is a five wide receiver roster spot for them like they're going to keep five wide receivers on their roster at least that's what my prediction is at this point I feel like it might be four running backs four tight ends five wide receivers is what we might see potentially so if you're looking at it that way I think adding a veteran in would be solid there you have one veteran four young guys and the Ravens don't necessarily have to have six wide outs I know they've done that the past couple of seasons they've had six they've had seven depending on you know who goes on IR and whatnot But a player like Julio Jones, the injury history is there. And honestly, it is real. I'm not going to shy away from that fact. I mean, there's a website here, draftsharks.com, that I I have pulled up. And they go through the injury indexes of players. And for Julio Jones, his chance of an injury in 2022, according to Draft Sharks, is 93% chance to miss at least two quarters. So I I feel like that's two quarters is high for a lot of people. Like I think a lot of people will miss at least two quarters in 2022, but the big thing for Julio Jones has been his hamstring. He's had a lot of hamstring injuries over the course of his career. And it it didn't start out that way. You know, he's had a shoulder injury, you know, thumb sprains, but you look at it and you hover over the hamstring here because you, you can actually hover over the body. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 different instances in 11 years where Julio Jones has either missed time or injured his hamstring. And you can, you can actually look through how many games he's missed. And just recently, the last, how many is this? The last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine injuries he has suffered, at least on this website that he has here. The last, though, that amount of number, that's how many injuries he has had to his hamstring consecutively. And there hasn't been anything else there on this website. And then you see that in 2020, he missed one game. And then another one in 2020, he missed week five against the Panthers. And then you have another one in 2020. He missed the next game after injuring his hamstring. Then he missed four straight games. Then he missed two games. He didn't miss any games. 
He missed another week eight game here. He missed three games. So you, you have to account for that injury history. I'm not saying that, oh, the Ravens are going to sign Julio Jones and he's going to play 17 games this year. I would highly doubt that. But you're looking at the rest of the veterans out there, and none of them have Julio Jones' track record. Julio Jones fits this offense, and a lot of them are injury prone themselves. Wolf Fuller's injury history, great player when he's healthy. His injury history scares me a lot. You know, and I'm, I'm not saying Julio Jones is doesn't, but you see, you see the competitive nature that he has, the ability to go up and get contested catches. I mean, the, the hamstring could be a problem again. I, I wouldn't doubt that it would be for a couple games, and it always, it always seems like he's on the injury report for something, right? But at the same time, if you can get solid production for even ten games, I'd say like low end ten games. You know, it's a, it's a Sammy Watkins situation almost because. When Sammy Watkins was signed, what was a lot of the discourse surrounding the the signing? It was, well, he's going to get injured, and he's going to miss time, and then what's it going to be like? And it was not it was not great when he missed the time, and it was not great when he came back because he wasn't really in the offense, and his role kind of shrank. But I think Julio Jones is just you know a different player, fills a bit more of a need. Sammy Watkins was a great veteran leader for this team for a year, but it, it just didn't work out. I feel like Julio Jones couldn't, and, and let's be honest, he's he's the best player left on the market of the position. I mean, again, it's not March. You don't have a ton of options at this point. Jarvis Landry was my top choice, a bit of redundancy with the role, but he goes to New Orleans. So now you're looking at you know, my top three, at least, are Julio Jones, Will Fuller, and T.Y. Hilton. And to me, who I do think signing a veteran would be beneficial to this team, Julio Jones is the one that I kind of have my eye on. And there are there are concerns with everybody still on, on the free agent market, but I think Julio Jones, the reward that you get when he's on the field, the ability for him to just demand coverage, demand attention, takes it away from the running game, takes it away from some of the other wide receivers, such as Rashad Bateman and Devin DuVernay and those guys. And, and Mark Andrews, we, we can't forget about Mark Andrews. It, it just makes this offense better, I think. And obviously, you got to account for the missed games, whether that's with an undrafted guy on the practice squad or having a veteran waiting in the way. I mean, who, who knows what it would be? You can kind of figure that out as, as the offseason continues. It wouldn't cost a ton of money, I don't think. I think Julio Jones, if you, you can get him on a two-year, $12, $11 million deal potentially where, where you could maybe push some of that money in the second year. I don't think the Ravens would be be good giving out one-year deals right now for a good amount of money. So if you can get a two-year, $12 million deal, I think that would be great for Julio Jones at this point. Maybe a two-year deal that's really only one year, but you're, you're able to get some of that cap relief in the first year because it is a two-year deal. You can spread that money out. I think that could be a great route to go. So I am on the Julio Jones train. I think it would benefit this team a lot. Obviously, you're looking at the free agent market right now in the in the middle of May, late May, and you're thinking, not a ton out there, but I think Julio Jones is one of the players out there that could really help the Ravens and in a position I think that is still a need at the wide receiver position that does have a ton of talent on the roster. Don't get me wrong, but I think Julio Jones would be beneficial for the Ravens to sign. We'll head into our final break here, though. Still a ton to talk about on Locked on Ravens. When we get back, we'll be diving into the retirement of Sam Cook. Just, again, celebrating his career, talking about memories of Sam Cook and Jordan Stout as well. So be sure to stay tuned. Still a ton to talk about on Locked on Ravens. But I do want to tell you about Rock Auto now. And with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's going to be pretty impossible for your location auto parts or to stock all the parts you need. And there can be pretty intimidating and even pointless questioning, and you have to wait while the person behind the counter orders the bars on their computer. And they can really only choose the brand that their warehouse happens to carry because, I mean, there's not really a ton else that they can do. But now you have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Rock Auto is a family business, and they've been serving do your suffers for over 20 years now, and the prices are actually really, really low for every customer, and they have everything. I mean, they have brake parts and tan lamps and motor oil and even new carpets, so everything you need there. You can go explore their easy-to-use website today to find the solution to your auto parts needs. So go to rockauto.com right now, see other parts available for your car or truck, right locked on. How'd you hear about us, Box? You know, we sent you amazing selection, reliably below prices, all the parts of car, wherever you need, rockauto.com. We're back here. Our final segment of Locked On Ravens, Kevin Ostriker, your host, still here with you. And again, thank you so much for making Locked On Ravens your first listen of the day. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube, like this video, and also follow us in audio form as well. And be sure to make your second listen, Locked On NFL, I host of the Monday show over there again. So if you want to hear me talk for an extra 30 minutes, we talk to a bunch of the hosts around our network about the latest NFL news. Let's now get into Sam Cook, And really, it just... It feels so weird, and, and we kind of talked about this with Q on our Friday show, so if you haven't checked that out, I highly recommend you do so, but it just, Sam Cook's no longer the punter of this team, the first time since 2006, obviously the Ravens draft pick out of Nebraska at that time, 
and just a, an absolute staple for what the Ravens did on special teams. One of the pure, consistent punters. And, and it's like stability, like that feeling that you have when Justin Tucker runs out for a field goal and you think, oh, yeah, this is going in like 100 percent. I'm I'm positive this is going right. When you, when you have that sense of stability and comfort when Justin Tucker goes out there to kick a field goal. It's the same thing that I had, and I'm sure many others did, when Sam Cook tried it out there to punt the football. You're thinking he's going to pin them back at the 20, pin them back at the 10. He's going to place it really well. He's going to bounce at the four, and they're going to get the offense is going to get pinned back, courtesy of Sam Cook. It's a stability now that with a 16 year veteran, I mean, that's crazy. 16 seasons. <laughs> it's unbelievable. The, the longest tenured Raven, he played more games in a Ravens uniform than Ray Lewis and Terrell Suggs, the most in franchise history at 256. He played 256 out of 257. He missed that game at the end of the 2020 year due to going on the reserve COVID list. So just, just one game short of going and just having every single game played that he could possibly play in a Ravens uniform. But Again, you look at the stats, and yes, we're pulling up punter stats here on Lockdown Ravens because punters are people too, by the way. Sam Cook punted 1,168 times, 52,868 yards. He had a long of 74 that actually came back in 2008, but he had a 73-yarder. He, he, he was booming that football, I'll tell you, but it wasn't just about his leg. I mean, he averaged 45.3 yards per punt. He had a booming leg, but at the same time, the Ravens, they valued his other aspects of his game he was a player that reinvented punting the cook hook all the other punts he invented I mean he said that he has players reach reaching out to him and he's had players reach out to him saying that they want to try out his punts they're trying out different things and different punts and he, he left a legacy not just on the Ravens organization because that definitely happened but throughout the NFL throughout football all of football punting used to be very directional right you were you would punt it to the right you would punt it to the left punt it in the middle and, you know, you'd, you'd have a returner go and, and field it and whatever, and you have the returner go either to the right, the middle, or the left. But Sam Cook, I mean, he did a lot in terms of just the way punting is today, you know, having that ball bounce, having it kind of have the backspin. The Cook hook is – is he is dubbed, and a lot of people have talked about many, many times. Punting is a whole different game. It's, it's a strategy game now, right, where you, you have to pin it perfectly at the one and – you're being able to put it out of bounds at the right point. And it's all stuff that Sam Cook has contributed to. And it's amazing to think about how just monumental of an impact that he had on this game. And the franchise, too, someone who was very hardworking, made an impact on many players. And I, I think the, the, the biggest factor in this, or at least one of them, is the fact that we are all, you know, Ravens fans everywhere, the organization is current teammates or I guess now they're all former, but his former current teammates and his former, former teammates were all praising him, you know, messages on Twitter, the videos that they made, their retirement press conference, their retirement press conference. I mean, beautifully well done by the organization, but it just felt, I mean, it was bittersweet in, in the purest sense of bittersweetness. I was watching it and, and, and you just, you feel this sense of like, there, there's kind of like a hole there where you're like, Oh, this this like sense of stability is gone. This great player, great person is gone. But at the same time, you're celebrating such an amazing career. And obviously the selection of Jordan Stout raised a lot of questions about Sam Cook's future. And a lot of people, myself included, kind of understood that it was likely the beginning of the end for Sam Cook. And he said himself, you know, that's okay. Stout is a player that's going to be, I think, a great one at this NFL level. Obviously, taking a punter in the fourth round had, you know, some people very upset. It, it did not make me very upset. But, you know, you kind of wonder what other positions could they have gone. But then you hear about the fact that other teams wanted to take him in that range. And people talked about there was almost like a, a war of punters when you're talking about Matt Areza from the now of the Bills and you have Jordan Stout, but a lot of people had Stout as number one because with Areza, it was more of, you know, the booming leg, the 80-yard punts, the 70-yard punts, and just being able to boom and flip field position that way, which is awesome. But you have Jordan Stout, who I think emulates Sam Cook a lot more than any other punter in, in the draft when you're talking about ball placement, the ability to hold. He takes his holding very, very seriously, Stout does. And the, the best part of this, in my opinion, is the fact that Cook is not – leaving the organization, right? He may be, he might be gone on the field, but he's staying with the team as a special teams consultant on the coaching staff. And he, he said himself, Cook said that he's looking forward to working with Stout, making him the best player he can be. And I think that is a one, a very big thing to do. I expect nothing less out of Sam Cook, but it makes me excited 
for what stout can be because we've already seen you know everybody's seen the highlights and and whatnot and just the ability that stout has as a punter but now to have coaching from one of the best at his position it's going to make him that much better cook said that he's already worked with stout on a couple things and that's another great thing to hear so for a player like cook who we're talking about a punter here right punters don't normally get a ton of recognition i think they deserve more than they get certainly but the fact that so many people are talking about sam cook so many people are praising sam cook for his contributions on and off the field the person he is the player he is right all these different things it goes to show how how impactful he was on the game on people's lives the wolf pack now was down to justin tucker in baltimore morgan cox playing for the tennessee titans cook retired it's tucker now you know maybe the the trio of Tucker, Nick Moore, and Jordan Stout can come up with something themselves, but it, it's Wolfpack forever. That, that's what it is. You, you can't you can't go wrong with the Wolfpack. Those are all players that have just meant have meant have meant so much to this team. And the the fact that Cook now is going after 16 seasons again, I'll go back to it. It still doesn't feel real. And you you could see a couple of mishaps early on in Stout's career in terms of just rookie mistakes. It's every position, right? Every player at every position, there are some rookie jitters, rookie mistakes, right? It's guys who are trying to adjust to the NFL. Sam Cook himself said that there was a play very early, or not a play, but he very early on in his career, he was close to getting cut by the Ravens because he just wasn't performing. And he ended up booming a kick that flipped the field, changed the course of his career. But it happens, right? God, it takes time for these things. It takes time for players. So Stout has very high expectations, right? He sees he's a professional professional football player. He has high expectations attached to him just because of that fact itself. But at the end of the day, I think that Stout will be a great punter for the Ravens. He has great guidance now in Cook. But the celebration of Cook's career that's been going on really all weekend, you know, the announcement comes down on Thursday. You have the retirement press conference, 3.30 on Thursday. People are still talking about him. Ed Reed tweeted about him, you know, yesterday, or yeah, yesterday, where he's talking about, you know, they were 10 years as running mates, and it was great for him and everything. I mean, you have guys reaching out on Twitter, current guys. You even have Jordan Stout paying his respect to him. So it's just been it's been great to see all the love that Sam Cook has gotten. He certainly deserves it. During his retirement press conference, you could see how much the game meant to him, how much the Ravens organization meant to him calling the Ravens organization the best in football. And that that's high praise. You know, some some people don't feel that way, but I think most people do when they leave Baltimore. It's not it's not it's not a for everybody thing. Nothing is. But I think for Sam Cook and what he was able to bring to the Ravens, it's just monumental, the career, the legacy that he has left. Now it's Jordan Stout's time, though. It's his time to pick up that legacy and be able to learn from that legacy and make one of his own. You know, there's no there's no replacing Sam Cook on the Ravens, right? It's like there's no replacing Marshall Yonda. There's no replacing Ray Lewis, right? But you can learn from those legacies. You can make your own legacy and follow in those footsteps. And I think that Jordan Stout has a great opportunity to do that and also learning from Sam Cook will help him in achieving his legacy, whatever it may be, but I have a lot of confidence in Stout, and I'm just very appreciative of the fact that I had the pleasure of being able to watch Sam Cook for so many years in Baltimore and just seeing the impact that he had on the organization, on his teammates, on, on his coaches, on everybody he met both as a person and as a player. But that's all I have for you here today on Lockdown Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in. When we get back here tomorrow, we'll be diving into more Ravens talk, of course. So be sure to stay tuned for that, and I will see you tomorrow.